Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Tim Ashman, Johnny Hernandez, and High Tech Oki. Coming up on DTNS, why AlphaFold's open database of protein folding structures is similar in importance to the invention of the microscope. It's pretty big. Plus, Warner Brothers Discovery's plans to merge its two streaming services, and Amazon may soon own Roomba. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, August 5th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And from New York, I'm Dr. Nikki Ackermans. And uh, I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We have a packed show, folks, so let's get right to a few tech things you should know. If you search for exact quotes of text, Google has an updated search results to bold that quoted text in the website snippet shown under the page title in the results. Google also began testing using large favicons and more prominent site names in mobile search. Nice. People seem very excited about those things, and, mm-hmm. and they, they are pretty cool. Uh, back in May, security researcher Zach Edwards discovered that DuckDuckGo's privacy-focused browser, not the search engine, the browser, exempted Microsoft domains from its block on loading third-party tracking scripts. We talked about it on the show. DuckDuckGo's CEO Gabe Weinberg said at the time it was due to search syndication agreements with Microsoft that he was trying to get changed. Now, Weinberg announced that within the next month, DuckDuckGo's beta apps will block almost all the scripts from Microsoft, but not all. The only exception will be for scripts for bat.bing.com. Those scripts load directly after you click on a search ad in the browser. To block that script, users will have to disable ads in the DuckDuckGo browser search settings. Uh, DuckDuckGo also made its tracker block lists available on GitHub if you would like to peruse them. Meta has released BlenderBot 3 to the public at blenderbot.ai slash chats. The company says it's designed to do the kinds of things that a voice assistant might do, like find recipes, maybe find restaurants or other places you might want to be interested in. BlenderBot 3 was built on Meta's large language model, similar to GPT-3. While it was trained on large text, it can also access the internet to find more information on more specific topics. Meta asks users to flag flag suspect responses to help improve its performance. That's kind of what they do when you do this sort of thing for the first time. All data collected during its public operation will be published for use by the AI research community. We asked BlenderBot3 what it would be like to say to the DTNS audience, BlenderBot, got any thing to say and it said let them know that bots can be trusted and will help make their lives easier we may seem artificial but we are here to help meta is also testing a standalone live streaming platform for influencers called super similar to twitch a few hundred influencers are already on the platform and apparently will keep 100 percent of the revenue generated from their time there at least for the time being by the way, I went and told Blunderbot we were talking about it right then while you were reading that. And it said, where did Daily Tech News Show go over my comments about bots? Did they just use part of what I said or did they take it all out of context? Jeez. Wow. Okay, sentient being. <laughs> uh, next week is DTNS Experiment Week. And we scheduled it before Samsung announced that it was going to have a big Galaxy Unpacked event on August 10th. But don't worry, Rob Dunwood and Rod Simmons have agreed to do DTNS Reactions, an experimental episode to give you first impressions right after the Galaxy Unpacked show is done. But almost everything they have to announce has either been teased or leaked. Uh, So if you want a preview, it looks like we're going to get the Galaxy Z Fold 4, the Galaxy Z Flip 4, the Galaxy Watch 5, and probably the Galaxy Buds 2 Pro. Uh, 91 Mobiles has the latest and largest leak of images, if you want to take a look at that. Uh, Meanwhile, for those curious about the durability of foldables, Sam Rutherford over at Engadget has reported on his last year using the Z Fold 3 he found it held up to some rough use uh, spills and drops and things like that but the screen protector developed annoying bubbles near the crease about six months after he started using it 
Well, we try to keep you up to date on central bank digital currencies, sometimes known as CBDCs, the blockchain-based currencies issued by national governments. The Bank of Thailand says that it's ready to start testing its retail digital currency later this year and expects the test to run through the middle of 2023. Around 10,000 retail users will take part in the test in a limited area. Meanwhile, in China, banks in two more cities have started to issue loans in digital yuan. As of this May, more than 4.5 million commercial outlets in China accept digital yuan. Almost every country has at least a plan for CBDC. Smaller countries like the Bahamas have had theirs in operation for a while. Some like China are in advanced testing. And most, like the U.S., are still in those planning stages. Yep, but they're coming. I mean, just just in covering this for the past couple of years on DTNS, we went from saying Bahamas is the only one to having them to, to, to that. So it is, it is changing, uh, as we all do over time. All right. Uh, <laughs> speaking of changes, uh, everybody is excited about the changes coming out of Warner Brothers Discovery, aren't they, Sarah? Oh, Tom, are they ever? Uh, we talked about this briefly on Good Day Internet uh, after yesterday's show concluded. Well, we have more information. We have some thoughts. Warner Brothers Discovery announced its first earnings since the merger of the two companies. Of particular interest was the number of subscribers to HBO Max in particular. Warner reported one combined number for Discovery Plus, HBO Max, and HBO on its own. Those three had a combined 92.1 million subscribers, which is up 1.7 million on the quarter. So that sounds good. The growth came entirely from international subscribers, though. Domestic subscribers fell 300,000 to 53 million. However, the company forecasted growth going forward, saying it expects to have more than 130 million global subscribers by 2025. Now, one of the reasons the company combined those numbers is that they have long planned. Uh, and if you've been following the story here on the show or on Cord Killers or places like that, you know this. They have long planned to combine the platforms. That's not the news. Uh, but in its earnings statement, Warner Brothers Discovery confirmed that plan, said, yep, what we've been talking about doing, we're absolutely doing, and gave us a timeline. So it's going to roll out a uh, combined service for the U.S. and Latin America in 2023, and then Europe and Asia Pacific in 2024. They pitched it as each platform bringing a strength. Uh, CEO and president of Global Streaming and Games, J.B. Perrette, noted that HBO Max has quote, performance and customer issues. In other words, the app kind of sucks sometimes, but it has rich features. It's got uh, some stuff that Discovery Plus doesn't have as far as discovery and tracking, while Discovery Plus has more limited features, but a more robust tech stack. HBO Max also has strong scripted, scripted content, both from HBO and from Max Originals, and a male skewing audience, while Discovery Plus has strong unscripted content your discovery science, your food, your home and garden stuff, and a female skewing audience. So the pitch is that combining them is going to give you all the content, all the audience, and rich features with a solid tech platform. All right. So after shelving Batgirl, Scoob 2, and removing several originals from HBO Max earlier this week, folks have wondered if the Discovery executives that run Warner Brothers Discovery really value HBO going forward. And if not... What does that future look like? Addressing some of those concerns, former Discovery CEO and now Warner Brothers Discovery CEO David Zavloff said, quote, we're going to spend dramatically more on HBO content in the next few years and that they had locked up the majority of HBO's executive team. Now, presumably, <laughs> that doesn't mean they locked them up physically, but they probably have some employment contracts, so they're going to be around for a while. Zavloff didn't provide any numbers to go with those comments, just saying quality is what matters. Warner also said that once it has rolled out the new combined platform for HBO Max and Discovery Plus, whatever they end up calling it, uh, that they're looking at launching what's called a FAST service. FAST stands for free ad-supported streaming TV. Think Pluto, Tubi, anything where you don't have to pay roll. to get it, Crunchyroll, uh, but there are ads uh, that, that roll uh, even though you don't have to pay. HBO Max offers an ad-supported version of its service, but it's not free, so it's not fast. You still pay $9.99 a month, but you just have limited ad interruptions. So this potential new free service 
would not have all the same programming as HBO Max or Discovery Plus. It would have a selection of it. Uh, a few other developments of note, uh, CNN Originals, a.k.a. what's left after they canceled CNN Plus, uh, is going to get its own hub in Discovery Plus. And I would presume that means it will eventually have its own hub in whatever the combined platform is as well. I mean, none of this is really, none of this seems like a bad idea to me. I think uh, when I've polled friends who follow these stories, maybe a little less than we do on the show, aka a lot less, you know, they kind of go like Discovery, Warner Brothers, CNN, HBO, that's all the same people? Well, didn't used to be. Uh, so yeah, there might be some Discovery... Uh, mysteries, uh, you know, where people are trying to figure out, haha, I know, uh, trying to figure out wh where the stuff they want to watch is and what bundle it might be part of. And if that's ad supported or, you know, what, what they're actually paying for. But I, I don't feel like any of this is like some horrible red flag where my favorite stuff is going to go to go away. They're just repurposing it. I mean, first of all, the mystery would probably be on history channel, not discovery, but yeah, I get, I get your point. Sure. Yeah. Uh, now, I know a lot of people are freaking out about this. My opinion is they might change the name, but I doubt much is going to change. I can't imagine they'll charge more for this for, than HBO Max, which is $15 a month. I don't know how they're going to sell a more expensive plan to Discovery Plus users, which who pay either 5 or $7 a month, depending on whether they want to have ads or not. Uh, Nikki, you're an HBO Max user, as I understand it. How do you feel about this? I've never even searched for anything that was on Discovery Plus, so this is not impacting me at all, basically. Like, let's see where it goes, and maybe I'll get more shows on my already subscription service. I was going to so say. Less if, services, less things for me to search for online. If next summer, all that happens is the name changes to be like Discovery HBO, and then you have a bunch of food and history stuff on there, are you going to be upset? No, fine. Good. Yeah, as long as they don't raise the <laughs> price, right? Well, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, let's talk about another uh, merger that's getting people upset. Amazon <laughs> intends to acquire uh, iRobot, uh, the, the folks who make the home robots, specifically the Roomba. Uh, Amazon's going to spend $1.7 billion all cash. Uh, for reference, Amazon reported having $61 billion in cash on hand at the end of June. So it was an easy They purchase. can afford it. Yeah. yeah. They were at the checkout counter already and they saw iRobot <laughs> sitting there. Uh, Co-founder Colin Angle of iRobot will remain as CEO post-acquisition. So it does sound like they're going to keep iRobot as a division, the way they've done with Twitch uh, or IMDb. Uh, Amazon acquired the robotics company Kiva Systems for $775 million in 2012. That's what's now called Amazon Robotics. Uh, and that is warehouse robotics. That is different than the home robotics. So it's not necessarily obvious that they would merge those two together. They may keep them separate. Well, as you can imagine, with any Amazon purchase, especially over the last couple of years, the public is skeptical. One argument I've seen a lot online is that Amazon might further intrude into our lives because Roomba vacuums can map out your home in order to clean it effectively, but then also know how you've arranged furniture, where you're the most messy, could give Amazon yet more personal data about how you live. And uh, understandably, there are a lot of people who are not comfortable with that. Now, iRobot, Roomba's company, privacy policy says that images captured for navigation are never sent to the cloud. And by the way, most Roombas don't even have cameras. Uh, it, is, it, is a, it is a feature on one of the more expensive models. Roombas can work without connecting to the internet. Users can opt out of sending any map data to the cloud. No data is sold to third parties, so says the company, but may be shared with third parties with customer knowledge or control, such as with voice assistants. Uh, not every Roomba works in the way that people are afraid of, though. For example, my Roomba, which is a 694, that was a former Live With It episode uh, from 2021, is Wi-Fi connected. It can be voice controlled with Amazon's assistant. In fact, that's how I get it to go, because sometimes I forget to run it before I leave the house, and then I, you know... I, uh, I, I I go ahead and say, yeah, please clean my house because I'm going to be gone for an hour plus. But it isn't drawing from any sort of map data. This is a Roomba that just crashes into things and tries to clean as much as possible. Also, uh, I think it's worth noting for the purposes of this conversation that Amazon already has all the Roomba data because iRobot uses AWS 
for cloud storage and, as, as you mentioned, is integrated with Amazon Voice Assistant. Uh, iRobot is experimenting with non-floor cleaning robots. If you're wondering, like, why are you just mentioning the Roomba? Uh, they have robots that clean gutters and pools and mop floors and mow the lawn. Uh, they purchased the air purifier company, Eris, uh, not too long ago. But the Roomba vacuum is where it's found commercial success. So that that's really why we're focusing mostly on that. Most people who have an iRobot pro pro product have a Roomba. Mm hmm. Yeah. And I mean, since I got my Roomba and I know it's not the fanciest Roomba, you know, it, it doesn't uh, <laughs> I still have to physically put all the uh, stuff that it gets off the floor into my garbage. Some Roomba models do that themselves, you know, into their own container. Anyway, I I'm a big fan of the Roomba. The Roomba has saved my life. I have to vacuum less frequently. I have a dog and a cat. So you can imagine that mm -hmm. if I didn't care, things would get out of control real quick. Uh, I also, you know, again, my apartment is not being mapped by my particular model, but if it were to be, I can see where if you want to, you know, d d go, uh, you know, very much on one side of the, uh, we're sort of scared about what Amazon knows about us to say, no, this is taking it a step too far. You know, Amazon's already listening. Now Amazon's going to know how I've mapped out my house. Amazon's going to know, you know, wh where I drop my food, where I might eat on my couch, you know, rather than my dining room table. And maybe, maybe that, that, that is a legitimate concern. I, I don't want to take that away from anybody, but I just feel like unless Amazon is going to straight apply and take a bunch of your data and do horrible things with it, which you might believe that it will do, but it can't do that as the companies work right now, I'm not sure how, especially given the, your opportunity to, you know, pull back some features if you're not comfortable with them, how this is as scary as I've heard it to be. Yeah. Nikki, how do you feel about this? Do you have a Roomba? Yeah, I have a knockoff. I checked the brand. It's called UFI, which is owned by Anchor. I don't know if that means anything. But hmm. if people yeah. are really, really concerned about Amazon taking over their life, then there are other options. And maybe they shouldn't have an Amazon Echo either in that case. So yeah. I, I'm not saying it's good that they might be taking your data, but if that's really a concern, then you can do other things. My, my gut reaction to people immediately saying, Amazon bad, I don't want this, is, well, hold on. If they keep the privacy policy the way it is now, and it looks like they're going to keep the company as it is now, so I would hope they wouldn't need to change the privacy policy, it mm -hmm. feels like it's okay, unless you just don't believe Amazon, like Sarah just said. Uh what does bother me is consolidation, right? Uh, there is now a very tilted marketplace for the home robot vacuum uh, dominated mm. by Roomba without Amazon's emphasis behind it. Now Amazon is going to be able to make that even more dominant uh, by putting resources into it. And like you said, uh, they can also, if you want, own your doorbell and your Wi-Fi router mm -hmm. from Eero and your Twitch streaming and your IMDb looking and your video watching and your shopping. Like it, it is a lot in one it's company. And so as long as you have choices, like you're saying, Nikki, then I think that's the answer for now. It does get scary that almost everything starts to be you know, owned by Amazon. It, and yeah, luckily yeah. we still have options, but I can understand people are concerned. Well, folks, uh, we have some things to make you feel better about the world all next week. It's DTNS Experiment Week, swapping out our normal DTNS shows and trying out some new ideas. You may remember last year we tried out the Tech John and Barbecue and Tech, and those are now going concerns of their own. Uh, this year, Rob Dunwood is back for an experiment. He and Rod Simmons, as I mentioned, are going to do a reaction show to Samsung's uh, Galaxy Unboxed announcement. Uh, Nicole Lee sat down with my wife, Eileen Rivera, uh, to talk about tech culture from an Asian-American perspective. Uh, there's a bunch of other shows in the hopper too. It all starts next week, Monday, August 8th, right here on the DTNS feed. If you're getting this show, you don't have to do anything. You're going to get it. So enjoy. On July 28th, Alphabet's DeepMind announced its AlphaFold network had predicted the protein structure of 200 million proteins. That is literally almost all the proteins known to science. Uh, and in addition, DeepMind made the database of those predictions available for anyone to access for free. 
Uh, Nikki, can you explain to us what AlphaFold is and, and why all those protein structure predictions are so important? So DeepMind is a London-based company that's owned by Alphabet, and they developed AlphaFold, which is a type of deep learning AI that predicts these protein structures. So AlphaFold was actually launched a year ago, and I covered it on Daily Tech Headlines. And they started out just by seeing if they could correctly predict the 350,000 proteins that were human-made. And they did. And now about a year after, the catalog has expanded to over 2 million entries. So Demis Hassabis, who is the chief executive executive at DeepMind, said that this essentially covers the entire protein universe, which is insane, honestly. Um, and, and these proteins have been sequenced from every organism with protein sequence data, not just humans. So that is a lot of organisms. And a protein structure, to understand what AlphaFold is actually predicting, it, di it dictates how a protein works in a cell. And so the structure is made out of a sort of string of beads of these chemicals called amino acids. And when these chemicals are assembled into sequences, they hold the instructions to an organism's DNA. Uh, this type of structure is also at the basis of most drug designs. So a more accurate prediction of, of this structure brings us more knowledge on how proteins work and thus how drugs work and lots of other uses. Okay, that, that makes sense to me. So if you know where the slot is on the protein that does the bad thing, you can figure out a drug that stops that slot from, from working. How did AlphaFold do this? So it's very, very complicated, but breaking it down into sort of understandable steps, AlphaFold system inputs the data from what we know about amino acid sequences and then creates multiple possible alignments. Uh, once it has these, it compares these alignments to similar sequences that we have already identified in living organisms and sort of makes a logical guess at what makes sense. Then it passes this information through a neural network architecture and it produces a 3D model of the protein structure down to the atom. And you can understand that scientists who work on this are super excited about having this 3D model that is so precise. Because in the past, each new protein that was being analyzed had to be done with expensive, time-consuming, and extremely precise methods. These are things called X-ray crystallography and cryo-electron microscopy. Even the names sound expensive. <laughs> and this is how we found out about their structure. Uh, now with AlphaFold, about 35% of the predictions are highly accurate, which is just as accurate as it was using these techniques. Um, and it's much, much faster took a month before from the scientists now it takes about a few days. And um, a little bit, you know, higher amount of these are 45% are accurate enough for many other applications. Okay. So, so that's 80% of these are, are really useful, basically. Pretty good. Yeah, Let's yeah. say pretty good. And overall, this sums up to 23 terabytes of data. So you can't just, you know, have it on your PC. But on the cloud, scientists can take this data and they're just rushing to keep up with the volume of predictions that are coming out of AlphaFold. And they're con continuously thinking up applications for all of this brand new, freely available data. Now, I, I know some people may be thinking, we sequenced the genome a long time ago. We, we know what the amino acids are for lots of stuff, not just human genome. We've sequenced mm -hmm. lots of genomes. So wouldn't we already know the proteins? So in some instances, we do know what the proteins are made of because we took the time to look at them, but we haven't looked at every single protein in the universe yes, it, yet. It, it takes a ton of precision, as I mentioned, to find out exactly how they're structured. We know the soup of all the things that they're made out of, but the way that they're sort of put together in the 3D space is really hard to predict. Yeah. And it, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I, I heard it, uh, ex, ex, the metaphor I heard uh, somebody use was, uh, I can give you a list of PC parts, but if you don't know how to put them together, that doesn't tell you, that doesn't allow you to make a working PC. So the, you could know the amino acids in the protein, but if you don't know how it's structured, you don't know how it really works. That's exactly that. And the rules are, are much more complicated and it's very, very, very tiny. Uh, so... <laughs> It's rough. And and some of them we can't, you know, we haven't predicted it yet, but AlphaFold is helping us out with that. Okay. So once a scientist goes into this database and says, ah, that's the protein I was looking for. Now I know the structure. How does that help them? So the database now contains almost every known protein. And this allows for researchers to look at things from a sort of backed away scale. Um, 
it, they can study different protein families on a large scale to help understand how they evolved. And they can focus on different proteins with specific properties. Uh, some of them can, for example, break down plastic or cause cancer. And so being able to figure out what specific thing in the structure is causing that is pretty helpful. That being said, AlphaFold still has its limitations. It's not designed to predict how a protein structure could change due to mutations from um, a disease, for example, mm. or what happens when proteins may interact with each other. But one of the goals of the European Bioinformatics Institute, which is who maintains AlphaFold's database, the code, the software, and the data are all open source. This is a huge monumental step in open source research and data. And so anybody can access it. Uh, you can go look at protein structures if you want right now. And uh, this bolsters the next generation of deep learning tools. So I love to hear that. Yeah, I, I, I heard uh, the Economist podcast compare this to the microscope uh, in, in the importance of a tool that now makes science much easier to do than it was before. Yeah, I mean, we basically now know a lot more about the building blocks, or at least we have access to knowledge about the building blocks of everything. Yeah, uh, everything biological. So yeah, it's a big deal. It's exciting. Well, when you can take two months out of your schedule of, of your work, right, and say, well, I don't have to spend that time figuring out the protein now, I yeah. could spend a couple hours instead uh, in this database. That's, that frees you up a lot, doesn't it? Yeah, and it frees you up to look into it and ask different questions. And, and there's a whole ton of cool research that's going to come out of this discovery. Yeah. Uh, so the AI is not taking the scientist's jobs. It's helping the scientists in this case. Anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. Just like Roomba. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. Uh, all right. Let's check out the mailbag, Sarah. We got one from Mike in steamy Dubai who says the know a little more Wi-Fi 7 episode was perfectly timed. My Asus router suddenly bit the dust. I was going back and forth about a simple replacement or upgrading to Wi-Fi 6. I didn't think any of the benefits would be worth it for our family. But hearing the Wi-Fi 7 episode confirmed my belief that maybe we should wait a little longer. My replacement router is on the way. <laughs> Mike says, a friend asked how I'm doing without Internet, having witnessed the outage happen on a call. I just responded, do I look like the kind of guy who has one router? <laughs> Thanks for keeping me up to date on this tech and helping me not waste money. I like that, Mike. And I'm glad that Know a Little More episode uh, was helpful. Uh, folks, go check that out, knowalittlemore.com. I definitely know that feeling of being like, do I look like somebody who's just got the one router? Come on now. Not my I need problem. internet. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Bodhi wrote in, uh, in light of the story in which we were talking about people paying to be a guest on a podcast, uh, Bodhi said, I would like to announce my new daily podcast, Namaste Finance and Tokens, or NFT for short. Oh, I'm, what fun! <laughs> I'm currently accepting offers to be my first guest, starting at $100,000. Use the promo code DTNS for a 50% <laughs> discount. Uh, of course, he's kidding. But uh, he also added, as long as everyone is transparent, paying to be on a podcast isn't much different than an infomercial. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I feel like if if you're somebody who cares about content and maybe there is something to be sold, uh, you know, whether it's a product or somebody's services in the future, um, transparency is key. Uh, and and people have different feelings about transparency, so that's a conversation to keep having. Yeah, you don't yeah, have to like an, an infomercial, but if you know it's an ad, then you you're know. paying for exposure. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> All right, uh, let's check in with Len Peralta, who has been drawing today's episode. What have you drawn today, Len? Well, you know, Tom, I know you were saying earlier that, you know, don't freak out about all these mergers and acquisitions. It's not going to be as bad as you think. You know, I don't, I, I agree with you to a Len's certain extent. I just think that some of these mergers. <laughs> yeah, like, where are, we, where are we going with this, Len? I... <laughs> Some of these mergers and acquisitions kind of give me a very Island of Dr. Moreau vibe. Have you ever seen that movie mm -hmm. where it's like experimentation with different type of creatures? Anyway, this is uh, this is called uh, the Island of Misfit <laughs> Mergers and Acquisitions. Actually, this is a scene from the Island of Misfit Mergers and oh, Acquisitions. Wow. I love uh, this. Coming summer 2023 on Discover <laughs> Bow Plus, which is my Per, you know my name if it's called mm -hmm. hbo d plus i'm gonna be really happy oh my god <laughs> I, I think it'd be funny to be called discoverable so you know 
I don't know. Yeah, both of them on there. That's that's good. Uh, If you're listening to the audio, as I know most of you are, you're going to want to go check this out. How do they do that? Please check it out. If, uh, well, if you're a Patreon of mine, patreon.com forward slash Len, you can get this parent right away. You just uh, go ahead and download it, or you can do it the old-fashioned way. You go to lenperaltostore.com. It's right on the front page right now, and you can download it and get it that way. So Thank check it out. So much, it's really Len. cool. That's so good. You should do that. Len, you are a treasure. Oh. Also a treasure is Dr. Nikki Ackerman. So nice to have you back with us. Dr. Nikki, let folks know where they can keep up with all that you do. It's very easy. They can find me on my website at NicoleAckermans.com and the reverse on Twitter at Ackermans Nicole. And if someone wants to do a PhD with me next year, I'm currently looking for students. So Yay. A little, congrats a on that. Bonus the there. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I feel like we have some people in our audience who would be like, uh yes. There's some AI so. stuff that I want to do. So very I good. say that with huge quote marks. <laughs> Well, it's if not you're interested, with, uh, get alpha-ful. a hold of Nikki. Uh, and if you need her information, it will always be in our show notes. Um, by the way, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send emails. If you have questions, comments, feedback on anything we talk about on the show, something you would like to, uh, us to talk about on a future show, all good. We are accepting them now. We also have a brand new boss, Alexander. I think we might know you already, Alexander. Just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Alexander. If you're new or you're, uh, you know, Return. coming on back. Yeah. Glad to have you. It's always good to have people back. Uh, always good to have people new. And if uh, you haven't been backing us and you start backing us or you're brand new backing us, uh, we like to give you a welcome to the show. So you you could be we that sure next do. person. Indeed. Speaking of patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. We call it GDI. We have a lot of fun on it. We might talk about food, might talk about science, might talk about both. You can also catch the show Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Just a reminder, DTNS is off next week for our regular show. But Experiment Week kicks off on Monday. We are so excited about everything we're doing next week. So keep your ears glued to the feeds to listen to all the great content we have lined up. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer Joe Kuntz. Technical producer Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer Jen Cutter. Science correspondent Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scott is one. BioCal, Captain Kipper, Steve Gautarama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A, Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Dylan Harari. Contributors on this week's show include Nika Monford, Scott Johnson, and Justin Robert Young. Our guest on this week's show was John C. Dvorak. And thanks to all our patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this broker. <laughs>